difficult, just challenging. Sex and defecation? Technically novels, if you can even call them that. Pretentious rubbish. An absolute ball ache to read. Hi guys, I'm Jen, and I make useful English lit study videos on Shakespeare, poetry, fiction, literary devices, and more to help you get top grades in the subject. Autism. Yeah, I know. Scary word. Probably one of the most loaded and thorny terms in literary studies, because it's virtually impossible to explain or define in a way that everyone agrees. And we also know that modernism is famously difficult. There's the iconic slogan of Make It New, which was proposed by Ezra Pound, who's one of the most famous modernist poets we'll go on to explore in this video, and the slogan is sometimes taken to crystallise the spirit of the modernist age. But to fall back on this short imperative would be a gross reduction of what's really a highly complex and fascinating movement. So what the heck is modernism? Well, let's find out. Beginning from the early 20th century, around 1909, and fading out with the start of World War II, modernism was a time of daring experimentation in style, aesthetics, and ideas, as artists, musicians, and writers revolted against the primness and prudery of their Victorian predecessors. Now, granted, there are debates around whether modernism had ever really ended, but in general, it's fair to argue that World War II marked a pivot away from the fervent, explosive artistic experimentation and social inertia which characterised the modernist era, because more immediate and human concerns came to the fore with the ghastly large-scale violence that was so evident in the early to mid-1940s. Of course, because when you've got hordes of hungry and dying people everywhere, deciding between using a Greek or Latin allusion to confuse your readers is probably not going to be the top of mind for anyone, not even for the snootiest of writers. So whereas 19th century writers cared about concepts like realism and verisimilitude, which is essentially describing reality in as accurate a way as possible, the early 20th century modernist upstart felt that linear narratives, long descriptions, and turgid language fell way short of portraying the fullness of human experience, which was also complicated by the rise of modernity. Our focus on this channel is primarily literary in nature, as we know, but it's important to understand that most literary movements, including modernism, were also cultural, philosophical, intellectual, and socio-political movements that involved multiple paradigm shifts in the arts, music, as well as politics. And in fact, this was especially apparent with modernism, because you had movements like Cubism and Surrealism, which emerged as new painting styles, while Expressionism and Neoclassicism introduced new ways of composition and music. It was also a period when artists and writers often doubled as cultural critics, and through the commentary of the zeitgeist, they would often advocate for radical changes in the way people should experience and engage with the world, according to them, of course. Now, given the limited scope of this video and the incredibly complex and multifaceted nature of modernism, I'll be focusing largely on the most distinctive characteristics and iconic authors in literary modernism. So I'm going to be looking at largely the high modernist poets and authors. So as a starting point, here are four key concepts to help distill what literary modernism is. It marks a turn away from conventional realist presentation to an embrace of avant-garde experimentation in style and form. It places an emphasis on portraying the processes of the human mind rather than those particularities of the outside world. It marks a deliberate distinction between highbrow and lowbrow literature, and this is often amplified by the writer's conscious effort to make literature difficult, elusive, and intellectually rigorous. It often expresses a desire to redefine the modern identity and modern existence, often in defiance against the pressures and chaos brought about by modernity. So let's now explore each of these ideas. Recall the pound injunction that I introduced at the start of this video, make it new. Ironically, this call for making things new is in fact anything but new, because as with every historical cycle, the sunsetting of one period always brings with it a desire to transform, innovate, and change the status quo. So after the long 19th century of Victorian realism, 
where focal objectivity, temporal stability, and narrative sentimentality were the norm, the modernists wanted to shake things up, to ruffle feathers, to rock the boat, to shock public sensibilities by writing openly about private topics like sex and defecation, in the case of Joyce and Lawrence, and also to push stylistic boundaries, often by rejecting grammar rules, formal conventions, and linguistic niceties. Whereas Victorian and Romantic poets would often use fixed verse forms like the sonnet, ode, or the epic, modernist poets consciously rejected such constraints and would present verse in unorthodox, extreme, and sometimes shocking ways. One example is imagistic poetry, which aimed at absolute concision by crystallizing brief but vivid moments in time into very few words and lines. For instance, here's Ezra Pound's poem, In a Station of the Metro, which contains just two clipped lines that read, the apparition of these faces in the crowd, petals on a wet black bow. That's it. Or if we cross the Atlantic, we can look at the American poet Wallace Stevens' The Red Wheelbarrow, which is a poem that doesn't really say much at all, but conveys a wealth of meaning through its sharp imagery and muted suggestiveness. And perhaps this avant-garde shock value is nowhere else stronger than in James Joyce's novels Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, which are technically novels, if you can even call them that, but they contain so much jumbled description, disruptive narratives, incoherent and made-up language that most readers, even the most learned ones, would probably find virtually unreadable. So just to give you a taste of what I mean, here's what some sections in these two novels look like. Brace yourself. Is this literary experimentation or just pretentious rubbish? But there's a point to all of this. In the Ulysses excerpt, the complete absence of punctuation is an attempt at recreating the continuous flow of one's thoughts, which do not pause at any given moment and resembles more like an avalanche of random information bits than a train of neatly arranged ideas. And in reality, we often see or hear things wrong. For example, the phrase North Armorica in the Finnegan's Wake passage could be someone's mispronunciation of North America, or it could be the narrator's mind thinking of an armor suit while he overhears someone say North America, but faintly in the distance. The point here is that we don't know. And for the modernists, radical ambiguity is often the point that they're trying to make. And the chaos that comes with the human experience should be portrayed in as unfiltered a way as possible because it is in presenting the reality of how the mind works as messy and chaotic and incomprehensible as it can be that we are reaching for internal truths. Finnegan's Wake is frankly more an art specimen or a political gesture than a book and it's not really meant to be read in the conventional sense because Joyce's point with this novel is to challenge the boundaries of human language and to show the limits and inadequacy of words in conveying the depth and complexity of the modern consciousness. Broadly though, this sort of avant-gardist impulse is a way for authors to contend with what they saw as a whole new world, where modernity and its disorientating effects daily complicate man's relationship with their surroundings. And so a complicated existence requires complicated modes of representation to do justice. And even then, actually, the job isn't quite done. By the way, guys, I'd massively appreciate it if you could hit the thumbs up button below, subscribe to my channel, and switch on that bell notification if you find this video helpful so far. This would really help me carry on making these useful English Lit Study videos so that you can get top grades in the subject and we can inspire more people to enjoy the study of literature. Now, one of the most distinctive techniques in modernist writing is stream of consciousness. And we've just seen an example of this from the Molly Bloom soliloquy in Joyce's Ulysses. It's a method whereby the writer attempts to recreate a character's flow of thought, emotions, and sensations in a way that's as similar to reality as possible. The metaphor of stream highlights the continuity and simultaneity of the thought process. And the word consciousness implies that human experience is an organic combination of not just thoughts and feelings, 
but also sensations and impressions, many of which we may not even be actively aware of. Joyce's novels may be a bit too convoluted and challenging to make for enjoyable reading for most people, including myself. So Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway and To the Lighthouse are equally great examples of stream of consciousness. And in my opinion, they are written in a more poetic style with a stronger sense of narrative development and consistency, as you can tell from these passages. While a common trait of stream of consciousness is garbled and sparse punctuation, it's also marked by sharp juxtapositions, abrupt interruptions, spontaneous interjections, jumbled narrative sequences, and a general sense of unhinged chaos and unpredictability in the text. And because the human mind and modern life in general are chaotic, unpredictable, and ever-changing. The stream of consciousness is often used interchangeably with the term interior monologue, which is more specific to a single character's perspective, hence the word monologue, right? Whereas stream of consciousness could include a variety of perspectives which are present in a given moment captured in the text. A good example of interior monologue would be T.S. Eliot's poem, The Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock which also happens to be one of my favourite poems of all time, even though it's actually a pretty grim and melancholic work. It's a work of free verse written in the voice of a middle-aged man who reflects wistfully on the passing of time and the passivity and lack of agency that he's demonstrated throughout his life. As he registers these trivial details and recalls these monumental moments that form the mosaic of his ambivalent consciousness in the poem. When we first read Stream of Consciousness, the writing can seem confusing and convoluted, almost as if there is no point that we can grasp or hold on to. But this, in fact, is a big part of its message. There often isn't actually a concrete point. And far from living a teleological existence where all action and thoughts tend towards some specific goal, the modernist subject is often simply there to be, to feel to experience and to demonstrate that the state of being is incredibly complex and something which no amount of human language or description can adequately capture. Did I mention that modernist literature is famously hard? To the casual reader, no, scratch that actually, to think that there would be casual readers of modernist works is quite paradoxical, because most people probably wouldn't consider giving themselves an intellectual migraine to be a leisurely pastime. So T.S. Eliot insisted that modern poets must be difficult, by which he meant that poetry, by extension all literature with a claim to seriousness, must be works of intellectual rigour. This sort of intellectual rigour is very often achieved with this sort of heavy-handed and often also heavily self-conscious use of the technique illusion. And a lot of the most seminal modernist works are elusive tapestries because they would include a wide range of intertextual references from past and contemporary literary works, as well as Anglospheric, European and foreign cultures. They are often these elusive puzzles and riddles that are just designed to give you a massive headache. For example, Pound featured Chinese ideograms in his epic Cantos. Eliot references Dante's Inferno in the epigraph to his poem Love Song of J. Alfred Prufrock, which we just read. Joyce adopts the narrative structure of Homer's Odysseus for his novel Ulysses. Yeats drew on Celtic occult symbols in his hugely influential poem The Second Coming. So why did so many of the modernists set out to make their work such an absolute ball ache to read? Now this is a complicated question, and while different modernist writers have their own varying agendas, an interesting point to explore to understand this is T.S. Eliot's claim of the impersonality of the poet in his essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent. Now if you've watched my video on romanticism, you'll know that romantic poetry placed a premium on self-expression, in that they believed that poetry was the ultimate outlet for the outpouring of individual emotions. But to T.S. Eliot, that is a load of crap. 
because he believes that poetry is a space for cultural engagement and intellectual sparring between past and present minds to take place. Not some kind of bully pulpit for the self-indulgent, egotistical artist to pour his heart out to the world. But with this new understanding of poetry, not as an expression of the self, but instead as an engagement with historical forebears, it was unavoidable then that modernist writing would be so encyclopedic in its scope, academic in content, and highbrow in register. Because these writers would have to cram in all of the different sources and references from a long and rich compendium of literature that all came before the early 20th century. This is also why modernist works often seem highly inaccessible and elitist. Because honestly, how many people would have read Greek poetry, Shakespearean plays, Italian epics, and much, much, much more as um, these pre-reads for even more hardcore English reading? Now, for all the emphasis on stylistic and formal experimentation, modernist literature was also deeply concerned with a key theme, and that was the overwhelming impact of modernity on one's sense of identity and one's place in the world. As more people moved away from the countryside in favour of the metropolis, this locus shift accelerated the pace of living and altered lifestyles. Whereas community used to be the basic social unit in the 19th century and before that, the individual is now left to their own devices to explore the excitingly sprawling but also cripplingly isolating city. This individual is also known as the flaneur, a trope which features in some of the most famous modernist works, such as Stephen Dedalus in Joyce's Ulysses, who walks along Sandy Mount Strand in Dublin, or Clarissa Dalloway in Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, who takes in the sights and sounds of Big Ben in London as she strolls along Westminster Bridge. The modernist protagonist is often an introspective character who seems to live primarily in their own head, as most of their environment is filtered through highly subjective, distorted, and chameleonic expressions. But on the other hand, you also had authors like D.H. Lawrence, who is not really part of the experimentalist crowd, as he retained the more traditional narrative style, but he was equally revolutionary in terms of the frankness with which he handled topics like sex and incest, as in his novels Sons and Lovers, The Rainbow, and Lady Chatterley's Lover. In fact, for Lady Chatterley's Lover, Lawrence was tried under the Obscene Publications Act of 1959. One of the objections to his novel was the too frequent use of the F and C words. And look how far we've come. Now, despite attempts to paint Lawrence's sexually explicit descriptions as no more than pornography, these people missed the point. Lawrence saw sex as one of the few areas of human existence that remained primal and untouched by modernity and its often dulling energies. It was a place where men and women could rediscover their natural selves in a world where authenticity and spirituality were being quickly swept aside by machinery, artifice, and utility. Lawrence was ultimately found not guilty, which for some marked the start of a more liberal publication culture in Britain, but his novels continued to be banned in other countries like Australia and America until much later. What Lawrence's example shows then is that modernist literature was characterized by a strong spirit of defiance, whether it be in style, form, theme, or content. Writers were often challenging boundaries to make a symbolic and political point, and they could frankly care less about pissing off the general public or about offending conventional sensibilities. In fact, the more shocking, the better. This contrasts with many romantics and Victorians who often wrote with the public tastes and preferences in mind, but not all of them. For example, William Blake didn't really write for the public and his works weren't published until posthumously. But William Wordsworth was so popular with the public, he was anointed Poet Laureate in 1843, while someone like Charles Dickens famously serialized the publication of his novels so that he could decide how to continue his plots based on the public readership's response. And that's it for this video, guys. Whew, I know, finally, right? I know this is probably a lot to take in, but I highly recommend that you look up the novels, poems, and authors that I've referenced throughout this video. Now, I know that getting to grips with modernism can be challenging, and it's a truth universally acknowledged that modernist literature contains some of the most difficult works ever written. 
When I was studying modernism, I also found it to be incredibly overwhelming and just challenging. So don't worry if a lot of this seems overwhelming right now. It's meant to be. Just because you can't be asked to read Ulysses from cover to cover doesn't mean that you won't enjoy or understand other modernist writing. So I've certainly, for example, not read Ulysses in full. And honestly, I don't even think most English professors have done that, except maybe, okay, say, a Ulysses expert. But in any case, modernism is a fascinating and important period in literary history, which is why it's a topic that's worth exploring for any dedicated and top grade lit student. So as always, I hope you found this video helpful in some way, and if you did, please do hit the thumbs up button below because that is going to massively help the YouTube algorithm and help me continue making these videos that I can help you and other like-minded, passionate lit learners to become top grade lit students. And if you haven't already, please do subscribe to my channel, hit that bell notification icon so that you don't miss out on any of my future study videos. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.